looking forward to chatting to you about looks like a good subject might be the scam things that are going on um what's happening in the, in the green environment and of course everybody's cottoning on jumping on the bandwagon and uh, pretending they're green and not always what they seem good afternoon tim hi good afternoon you've been doing a bit of study on that this week what what have you discovered that you think we really ought to be watching out for well, as I've been getting quite irritated by some of the stuff that gets passed around on Facebook that looks at face value to be a good idea, but always turns out not to be. Uh, I, one of my favorites is the solar roadways scam, uh, where usually these schemes are put up by somebody that's put a nice crowdfunding page up somewhere and they're wanting you to invest your money in developing the idea. They'll show you some mocked up pictures of what, uh, with the solar roadways, they've got one that shows you what a road might look like if you covered it in these things. The problem is, once you look into the physics of it, I mean, solar energy is difficult enough as it is without using roads to generate it on. So you start thinking, well, what happens when cars drive over these things? What happens when they get covered in oil and grime? And kind of uh, I mean, there are people out there that have done the physics. I mean, there are studies out there showing that solar roadways are impractical. Um, I, in a way, I, I'm, I'm less bothered if people want to invest their money in scams. I mean, that doesn't bother me that much, as it strikes me that the whole of our economy is one big scam. <laughs> uh, it's more that I think there are more sensible conversations that we could have about what works. I've seen that about the solar roadway and I must admit I thought mm, well I suppose it makes sense you've got a large area that's out there that's that could be covered but mm. I must admit when I had a look it seemed like they were made of glass which I thought well that's a pretty impractical sort of surface to be running cars across but mm. uh, the, the idea is is quite good it's a bit like the uh, that, uh, flow hive I saw I think because I'm a beekeeper, just about everybody I know sent me an email or a Facebook message about the flow hive, which was supposed mm. to be something you could turn a crank a handle and the honey would flow out and you wouldn't have to disturb the bees inside. Again, mm -hmm. one of those utterly impractical things, and anybody who'd been anywhere near a hive would know that beehives usually got bees in, and those flow hives certainly didn't have any bees in. And if you didn't mm. start pouring the honey outside into a jar, you know, it wouldn't. The bees will be all over it, along with the wasps and everything else that's trying to get hold of it. Mm. As a beekeeper, what we try to do is not to allow anything sticky to be outside of the hive because it just attracts mm. all the pests who are there all the time hunting to get in. You know, bees create honey and everything wants it, not just us. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these things play on our emotional desire to want to do something good for the environment. Uh, yeah, so you have something that at face value looks like, oh, yeah, that might work. Um, because these things have to be at least vaguely plausible. Um, <laughs> mind you, one of my favorites, there's a wee Indian guy that claimed to be running a motorbike on river water. Uh, and I mean, I'm afraid it just doesn't work. No, that's uh, it's my phone going off. I thought it might have been Chris's. <laughs> I can't quite get to it. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, well, I mean, basically, we know how to power a motorbike on water. I mean, you could do it by electrolysizing the water that will turn it to hydrogen and oxygen. You can then burn the hydrogen with the oxygen, and that will produce power. The problem is that you have to put more power in than anything that you get out. And that means you're going to need an awful lot of hydrogen to power a motorbike. I mean, it could be done. But one of the ways I look at these things is to say, well, who's doing it commercially and what are they doing? So, I mean, the world has plenty of hydrogen power vehicles at the moment. I mean, most of the big car companies have prototypes running. Uh, there are several cities around the world now that run their buses on hydrogen. And all of them do it by extracting hydrogen from natural gas. And they do it using a hydrogen fuel cell to run an electric motor. And you start to think, okay, why are they doing that? So why aren't they just burning hydrogen like this guy on Facebook? And the answer is because burning hydrogen is totally inefficient. Uh, so essentially hydrogen is a really good way of storing energy, but the amount of energy that you put into making it means that it's never going to be a source of energy. 
Um, so essentially what a lot of people are doing is generating electricity using green energy, using the energy they create to electrolysize hydrogen, and then using the hydrogen as a way of storing that energy. Mm. But the most efficient way of deploy, deploying it is using a hydrogen fuel cell and connecting it to an electric motor and not an internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it makes me automatically suspicious if somebody comes up with something that's very different to where leading edge technology is in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with solar roadways. I mean, the most efficient form of solar energy that I've seen at the moment as a passive deployment is on bodies of water. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll take a reservoir or something and just float solar panels on them. Um, now if you do it more, there, there are the big solar collector plants, like in Spain, I think Morocco is building a build, big one where they actually, the mirrors follow the sun and direct the energy. So those are hyper-efficient at a large scale. But you know, that's how you do solar. You know, what you don't do is put it flat on a road where it's at the wrong angle to the sun, then drive vehicles over it all day. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so again, it sounds plausible. It, yeah, it looks nice, and everyone wants it, gets that cuddly feeling if you invest in something like that. But the reality is, you're better off in, in investing in what's already working. Yes, but sometimes it's hard. Well, it is hard for the layman to understand. I mean, it's hard for me. I don't really understand hmm. enough about the energy side of things. I can quite good on the food side, but not so much on the energy side of things. It's, it's difficult to know which of these things out there are affected and which ones are going to be uh, worthy of, of further investigation. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I kind of think you know, much of what you see on Facebook is more likely to be a scam than it is to be a genuine offer. Um, yeah, I mean, accepting that, yes, some people have got ideas that need crowdfunding that the mainstream isn't going to touch. Uh, I mean, the better one is to look at the idea of energy in and energy out. Mm. So essentially because you can't get more out of the system that you put in. So I mean, there's a guy that's come up with this idea of what it looks like is a bicycle attached to a flywheel. Mm. So essentially you pedal like fury for an hour and that'll keep the flywheel turning. And his claim is that will run your house for a day. Now the problem with that is the only energy source there is a human being. And human beings are incredibly puny at generating electricity. <laughs> uh, so we'll do a bit. Yeah, I mean, anyone that, that my age that rode a bicycle back and forth to school in the 1960s and 70s will remember the little dynamo motors that you used to put onto the wheel to run your lights. And basically, you could just about pedal enough power to power a little battery light. Mm. Uh, that's the kind of electricity output you get out of a human being. Uh, I mean, the flywheel doesn't add to the energy in the system. It just allows the energy to keep going. So essentially, you have to put a lot of effort in up front to get the flywheel turning. And once it is turning, it can then generate energy after you've stopped. Mm. Um, I mean, the problem with it was this guy had originally designed it. Uh, the claim was that it was to provide power to housing in places like India and Africa, where you didn't have a lot of energy. Now, the problem with that is a lot of the people in the areas where this was supposed to be deployed don't have the kind of extra calories that we have so if you like <laughs> it, it's not it's, like anywhere near as much food as we do we're, we're pretty lucky in the west aren't we yes yeah, so, i mean it was a first world solution to a third world problem in a way that if it was me yes i, I carry plenty of extra pounds i could probably do with an hour workout on a bicycle every day and if that provided a bit of extra electricity that's fine if you're struggling for food, then you really can't afford to spend an hour pedaling an exercise bike. <laughs> Just to get a bit of electricity. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, the opposite side of that then was the amount of energy that it delivers. I mean, if you're living in a kind of rural village somewhere where you don't have access to electricity, it would provide you with enough to light your house in the evening. Uh, you know, deploy some LED light bulbs and you've got lighting for the evening, which could allow you or your family to educate themselves. I mean, it's a good thing, but you haven't got the calories there, whereas we have plenty of calories, but we would want it to do far more than it does. Mm. So what would you say were the best energy ideas that you've seen so far? 
uh, best the best that's out there at the moment that we could deploy immediately as a national power source is offshore wind. Um, yeah, basically that technology exists. It's uh, the second and third generations of wind turbines are far more efficient now than the first ones that everyone complained about. Uh, yeah, so at the national level, there's that. Uh, the other one is just rooftop solar. Um, you know, rather than you know, how do we invest in something that promises the world but probably isn't going to deliver it, actually go with what we've got. Uh, solar panels are getting more and more effective. They're also a lot cheaper now than they were. So it makes far more sense to, uh, for us to invest in those than it does to try to invent you know, what's likely to be a not very workable alternative. What do, what do you know about the heat pumps? I know my father put a heat pump in and it seems to be working exceptionally well for him. However, he does live in Australia where, of course, the temperature tests tend to be rather, rather warmer than here. But I don't think it really needs huge energy to get the heat out the other end. It works a bit like the fridge, doesn't it? Compress the gas that expands and it's that expansion that where you get the heat from rather than the, the specifically the air temperature. Yeah, I mean, it's it's far more efficient than setting fire to something as a way of keeping your house warm. Uh, and I mean, certainly in conjunction with sort of cavity wall insulation, attic insulation, all of that, it's really workable. Uh, I mean, my ideal house would have a air source heat exchange pump. It would be fully insulated and you use your solar rooftop energy to power the heat pump. Um, yeah, plus you then deploy rooftop solar thermal to keep your water hot. Yeah, and I mean, you, you, know, I, mean you, I doubt whether you'd get off grid entirely, this being Britain. You know, I mean, once the winter comes in, you're not going to have enough sunlight and kind of um, but it's, uh, I mean, just at a practical level, that would dramatically reduce your energy bills every year. I do know somebody who has um, solar panels on her roof, and she believes, well, she says she generates about a thousand pounds per year over and above mm. her use. And she uses all modern equipment. You know, she's got mm. the dishwasher, the fancy lights, and all the rest of it. So it's not, um, she doesn't hold back on using those things. She does tend to try and use her washing machine on a timer during the day whilst she's out she'll set it to come on at sort of 11 o'clock or something as opposed to you know maybe mm. nine ish when she goes out the door which i do tend you know just before i'm going out the door i'll put my washing machine on with well, that tends to be more like about half past six seven but it's probably still kicking into the time when the power generation or power use is, is hotting up mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, those people that I know of that run solar panels, I don't. Uh, apparently, the company that looked at my roof claims my roof is too small. Mm. <laughs> um, my colleague, Julia, they have rooftop solar. I mean, they benefit quite a bit from it. Mm. Uh, I mean, this time of year, particularly, I mean, it's, uh, in that said, I think mid-December, when the sun is really low, they get next to nothing from it. Um, you know, so I fear that in this country it is really variable with what you get from it. That's, um, that's the, um, um, the big, big push, or the big complaint, isn't it? That it's that it's not hmm. consistent. Whereas you know you've got a power. Yeah, I mean, I view it more as a way of saving energy than a way of generating it. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if you like, by running your equipment off your own solar energy, you're not having to draw energy down off the grid, mm. you know, which is good for the environment in the sense that we don't need to be burning the, uh, the coal and the gas that we'd otherwise burn. But we do have problems with the winter. Um, you know, that said, I mean, wind power, offshore wind particularly, is you tend not to get the fluctuations with offshore that you get with onshore. Yes, I would imagine that would be true because you've always got wind over the sea, or virtually always, haven't you? you might not. Pretty much. I mean, they you know, they reckon even when on land we probably have perhaps a week or so of high pressure air where there's not much wind. Even then, if you go sort of a mile offshore, there's still a pretty steady breeze going. Mm. Um, you know, whether or not that would generate all of the country's needs, probably not. But then you don't want to just deploy wind. You know, I mean, you'd have everything else. Uh, you know, one of the things that's of interest in my part of the world is tidal. Yes, uh, that's, that, you spoke about that before, and it seems to me pretty 
sensible really to, to look harder at that because after all tides happen every single day don't they? nothing really stops them yeah i mean it's twice a day and you can predict it with accuracy for centuries to come you know i mean that's the one thing that is predictable is the tides uh i mean if you go you know, just south of me onto the seawall at cardiff bay we have close on a 40 foot tidal range so between high tide and low tide, the water will actually drop 40 feet. Mm. Uh, now, if that's harnessed either through a tidal lagoon or a barrage, you can generate the equivalent of two or three big coal-fired power stations. Um, yeah, and that's effectively free electricity. I mean, that water is going to be there every day, twice a day. <laughs> Without anybody of interruption, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it takes a bit of work, presumably investing in building it, but you know, you're going to get the return on the investment fairly quickly. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So for me, it's a bit of a no-brainer that you'd put in tidal lagoons or tidal barrages wherever we have those kind of tide ranges. Uh, I mean, South Wales has a few of them. I think Swansea Bay, again, uh, the tide comes in and holds the water in the bay. Then as the tide drops, you get a whole bay full of water trying to empty out. Uh, then the Menai Straits in North Wales, in between the mainland and Anglesey, that acts like a funnel. So when the tide in Liverpool Bay goes, you get sort of this funnel effect down through the Menai Straits. Where the straits actually look like a river if you go up there, I and mean, people canoe on there, so it's like white water canoeing. Um, yeah, it is a really fierce kind of body of water running sort of down one end of the island to the other. So again, if you can put turbines in there, you generate a lot of ele electricity. Makes sense to me. Oops, I'm just moving this a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it sort of struck me that there are things that are available to us now that you know, we could be, or we as an economy, as a nation, we could be deploying them this very minute. Whereas a lot of the other stuff that everyone's talking about is stuff that isn't actually available yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have this big nuclear power station that's now on hold again down in Hinkley Point. Uh, where the only one of those that's been built has so many technical flaws at the moment that they can't get it running. Uh, we have a government plan to sort of hydraulically fracture shale formations to produce gas, but nobody knows whether there's any actual gas there. Um, yeah, so there, uh, it seems to me there's an awful lot of gambling on things that might pay off in the future, but not much investment in things that we know will. <laughs> That doesn't make sense, does it? You'd think that, that whilst we have the, the, the known stuff, we'd stick with it, but that obviously doesn't seem to be um, floating the boat of those that are making the decisions. But interesting, I mean, the companies that are looking like they're going to deploy, particularly offshore wind now, are the oil companies. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, they're starting to realise that there isn't much of a future in oil. Um, and the, uh, the CEO of Shell a fortnight ago told investors not to think of them as an oil company, but to think of them as a gas and renewables company. Yes, I understand that. And I saw that in, um, oh gosh, where was it? Um, Saudi, I think it's Saudi American oil mm. company. I think it was Saudi American oil company. It was certainly in Saudi Arabia anyway. Got huge, great, like, 180 hectares. Of glass houses with solar panels inside. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Saudis are desperate. That's not a small investment. No, I mean, the Saudis are desperate to wean their economy off oil. Uh, now, part of it is sort of somewhat cynical. I mean, part of it is they know that the global oil supplies are running down. Uh, they want to be able to keep exporting for as long as they can. So essentially what they're looking at is, okay, with the oil that we're drilling out of the ground, how do we make sure that the majority of it is sold for export? Well, one of the ways you do that is to convert your domestic economy to run on renewables. Uh, so it's almost the opposite of what Britain is doing. Like Britain is pretty much sort of agreeing to have third world status. That, you know, basically we're going to use what remains of the hydrocarbons we're digging out of the ground to run our own central heating and our own cars. And then when the crunch comes, we'll be dependent on the rest of the world to sell us energy. Uh, it's uh, really crazy, doesn't it? It seems to me to be a really odd way around of doing things. Just hmm. well, with most um, politi 
political things, very short-term thinking, because you know, we're in power today and we'll be gone and somebody else's problem then. Yeah, I mean, if somebody wrote that as a strategy in a business plan, yes. you know, I mean, the idea that we're going to invest in something that's going to run out and we're not going to invest in sort of having a business that's going to run more than three or four years hence. Absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah, but that's what governments are doing. I mean, I suppose the risk-taking bit of it, yes, we do that in business. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I guess most people want a plan B. You know, it's okay. Well, if... I can understand they want a plan B, but why you'd want to do, um, to, to not invest in the things that you know work seems to be a bit hmm. odd. Anyway, yes, so I suppose, so our advice is, Put up your solar panels if you can possibly afford it so that you at least can um, generate a bit of power. And I guess we must yeah. need to, in the future, look much harder at how we could store that so that we can use it when we're generating extra rather than give it away, put it, put it to use. Well, I think heating systems are shaping up to be quite a good storage system. I mean, they reckon they'll do it with smart meters. It certainly seems to be making a bit of a difference. I've, I've seen them in people's homes and, and I've been quite impressed by the fact that once you understand and start to take a look at when you're generating extra or when you're using a lot, it just makes you sort of um, at least become much more aware of, of what power you're using and, and how you might change your habits. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the ideas they had is if you had a smart metering that allows somebody remotely to control various gadgets in your house. So their idea is when you have shortages of energy, they can turn things down. Yes. Uh, you know, so effectively they can sort of work out well, what in your house is running that doesn't need to be running. But the other thing they were saying in relation to hot water was because all of us tend to have hot water systems where we'll have a storage tank that we keep the hot water in. Yes. So their idea was that they'd use periods where, where we had excess energy to effectively heat everyone's water. <laughs> um, yes. So that then the hot water would in effect be a storage system. So we, we've converted the energy from electricity to heat. But what we've then done is saved on you know, having to provide energy to heat the water at a later stage, perhaps when there isn't enough energy. That makes sense because heat, you know, water can be kept warm fairly well isn't it hmm. like, it, like it, it doesn't lose its temperature too quickly or boiling to 90 probably hmm. much but when most of our hot water is sort of sitting at 60 ish or even less hmm. it doesn't lose it so quickly from there yes i mean it's it's one of a number of ideas that they've got for how we might say or preserve energy uh, the bigger ones, I think, that are limited are, but they're doing them in Scandinavia, is using artificial lakes to pump water into when you have a surplus. Then you generate hydro on the way down when you've got a shortage. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I think we're limited on what we can do with that in this country now because of the need to flood valleys and stuff. I mean, people aren't going to be too happy with that. No, well, none of us are, are we? If we're going to potentially lose either where we live or somewhere we like. Yeah, it's going mm. to be a tough one, but... Um, mm. Yeah, so it's, it's... I mean, there are things in the air that will allow us to do more than, I think, what people have given credit to with renewables. We do have high levels of water in the, sort of the north of the country and not so much in the south. You can't mm. help thinking that there's, there's got to be a better way of running that around the country. Well, I mean, it was proposed, I mean, you remember 1976, was it, when we had the drought, where they proposed setting up a national grid for water then. Mm. Uh, but I mean, whether or not, I think it went against the privatisation when they privatised water. So they had some idea that they'd get water companies to compete. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, I mean, in Wales, we do quite well. Our water is delivered by a not-for-profit company that's actually invested quite a lot in the system. So we actually have a very good water supply at a reasonable price. How's the, uh, how's the drainage? Is that, does that, is that part of that same system? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. They, I, know, I suppose at the time when they became a not-for-profit, I think Wales had a real problem with the beaches. 
there's been a lot of raw sewage getting out and kind of, uh, but they actually put a hell of a lot of money into cleaning up so that you now have, uh, Wales actually has a lot of these European blue flag beaches now. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, even some of the ones, because up this end along the Severn Estuary, because it's an estuary, it's going to be full of mud anyway. So the expectation was that we'd never have clean beaches up this end, but we actually do. I mean, you know, some of the beaches that going back when I was a teenager were filthy with pollution, you know, are now very clean. Um, so yeah, I mean, they have done a very good job there. I do mean, very quietly. I mean, while the rest of the water companies have been hammered for increasing people, increasing people's bills without investing properly in the infrastructure, uh, it's one of the things that Wales did well. It's just, you know, it's good, isn't it? It's, it's uh, be good to see if they could repeat that around some of the other parts of the country. Well, I mean, I'm a big advocate of having not-for-profit utility companies. Um, and I says I would favour nationalisation, but the problem with nationalisation in the past was it was very badly done. Plus, it proved all too easy for another government to come in and just sell it off again. Yes. Uh, whereas I think uh, yeah, Welsh Water is a private company, so the government, other than through regulation, I mean, they can't just come in and tell them what to do because it's a private company. Mm. Uh, but running on a not-for-profit basis, I guess, is the best you're going to get in terms of being sort of friendly to the community, as it were. Mm. Um, you know, so, I mean, yes, if our electricity and our railways and all the rest of it were run by not-for-profit not companies that wanted to run in the interest of the population, not the shareholders, I'd be all up for that. You're speaking um, a couple of weeks back about talking about cleaning, sorry, my mind has jumped. Um, <laughs> you were talking about you were having a go at soap making. Have you still been doing that? I haven't done any this year yet. I may do some later on. Um, I was trying to figure out how to film myself doing it so I could post a video somewhere, perhaps. Um, it's it's not a particularly massive, messy process. <laughs> it's just time consuming. Um, Did you use it for more oils or have you used solid soaps that you've created and recast um what i do is mix the i mean you need an oil or a fat base uh, and then you need your lye mm -hmm. which is sodium hydroxide or sodium hydrochloride uh, uh, so basically you need a solution of that so it's caustic soda they say you've got a caustic mm -hmm. soda solution and either a fat or an oil uh, which you then mix in the correct proportions and you've got to get them both and basically, when you make caustic soda, it heats up. Uh, they always say that you put your soda crystals into the water, not the other way around. And mm -hmm. basically, if you pour water on soda crystals, you're going to get an explosion. It's going to land all over you. So you have to add the crystals to the water. But the temperature will go up, I suppose, about 60 or 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. So you need to get your oil to the same temperature as the soda before you mix them. The rest of the process, to be honest, is just a slog stirring it. <laughs> and I use one of those, you know, your food blender, whizzy things. Yeah. I tend to I use one of them. I've got one that's just for doing caustic soda, so we don't mix it with food afterwards. <laughs> but I found that easier to do than sort of standing there with a wooden spoon stirring for an hour. Um, uh, basically, I mean, you stir it until it. Uh, the process is called soapifying but it will start to go sort of a bit like detergent, that kind of texture, so sort of thicker oil. Uh, so you get it to a point then where you can pour it. Uh, so you put it in a mold and store it for, I think about six weeks to two months. So you want it in a warm place and that'll dry it out. So it then actually turns to a bar of soap. Or, um, I mean, I did mine using yogurt pots. Uh, so I had lots of yoghurt pot shaped bars of soap, uh, which I then gave out to people as Christmas presents. Um, uh, you mix in, uh, you can mix in colourings to add to a colour, or if you get the essential oils, so something like a lavender or you know, perhaps a citrus essential oil and add that to the mix. You have to add quite a lot of it, uh, but that will give it a flavour or a scent. Um, yeah, so that's I mean, the aesthetics. I've just been researching that side of it because I'm interested in whether you, 
make a soap that would say antifungal. You know, so mm. you know, for your athletes, virtual you know, your skin troubles. Mm. It's quite common for people to be um, have, to have fungal problems on their skin because we're we're attacked by it all the time. It's just a matter of whether we're strong enough and mm. to, to fend it off. But I was thinking that was something that we use on our skin such a lot. Mm. It would be quite handy to have an antifungal. So I wonder if you could add iodine to the mix. So I was looking at um, whether, we, whether that was possible, which oil you might use to do it. For instance, you could use, say, borage oil. Having said that, a five-litre bottle of borage oil is a couple of hundred quid. It's not, it's mm. not very cheap. <laughs> so I was thinking, hmm. and then when it's, it's converted into soap, does it still have the same uh, potential anyway at the end of it, mm. which is difficult to see. But that, um, from what I can see, a lot of the essential oils, are, but they basically got multiple compounds and parts of it, particularly the phenols, do tend to become soap. So the mm. active state is going to be changed. But quite often it would appear that they don't necessarily lose their um, um, fungal activity. Mm. So it's um, just been trying to discover which ones would potentially carry mm. through and then have that effect. But unfortunately, we tend to need the essential oils because they're basically very concentrated plant. Mm. Um, is where, where you're really going to get the effects and clove and um, what's the other one? Um, I can't remember which the other one is. Uh, thymol do tend to get affected by the soap system. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Although there are different ways to make soaps, and I understand if you use a hot soap system whereby you heat your oil up, you put the lye in, you get that to all happen hmm. so that the lye has actually done its job but you've held it hot. You hmm. can then put the essential oils in, yeah. then once it's all done it's so uh, soporific stuff, so hmm. that um, it doesn't get converted into soap so you've got your essential oils as a separate yeah. entity. problem with that of course is the soap tends to be quite hot and a lot of essential oils um, will tend to to boil it hmm. well it seems, it seems to be most of them are quite happily stay you, you have to choose your oils because some of them will boil at the same temperature which means you're just going to lose those volatile oils anyway but if you could hold it down to sort of 200 ish degrees Fahrenheit, hmm. I guess, the american science we've been looking at um we could possibly make something quite useful so i'm, hmm. I'm quite interested in, in whether we can achieve that and also, if, if the soap, if the oil is going to be converted into soap, whether the um, fun, um, fungicidal activity is still hmm. possible, and it wouldn't appear that nearly every plant has that ability, because obviously it has hmm. to fight off fungal infections itself as a growing plant, and um, so they all have some systems within them that help to do that, because they've been looking again, about how you might use essential oils to stop um, funguses growing on your greenhouse tomatoes and things, hmm. instead of using synthetic chemicals that we're worried about. Hmm. But you have to use it at quite high levels, in which case they're almost as nasty. Yeah. yeah. Really high levels. But I mean, not always. Some of the waxes will hold, um, hold off fungus and um, they, they don't, you don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, they don't need to be nasty waxes. You, you, mm. fruits, fruits and um, lemons now are also often waxed in order to hold off fungal growth on the surface. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of these interesting subjects. The more you go into, the more you can find to do. I, my interest initially was just working out how stuff was made. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I looked at the medieval way of doing it, where you burn hardwood and then run rainwater through the ash. Uh, that provides you with a sort of fairly weak caustic soda solution, uh, which, of course, in those days, they'd mix it with animal fat to make soap. Uh, and you have all of the problems with trialing and erroring to work out what's going to soapify and what won't. Um, but yes, I mean, if ever you had a situation where there was no other way of making soap, that's how you do it. Um, 
well, that's how we started off making it, wasn't it? We, we've learned along the way the, the chemistry to get that a bit more, um, let's say, uh, exact. But yeah. but nonetheless, it came from those systems. The same with a lot of the essential oils and the ways that we use them for medicines. Um, but yeah. but now the, been looking across the world at, at how that works what is it that actually does the job and and mm. are they still effective and some of them really do come up against the the so-called modern day synthetics you know, mm. they really do work well um, some things in uh, clothes one that sticks in my mind as being one that's 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 highly effective and does stand up against a lot of the modern day chemistry mm. but um there are others, but um, that just happens to be one that's sticking in my mind. But you know, some some of the things that we're using now, they might be effective, but they're not necessarily. They have such strong side effects; they're not necessarily so good. But obviously, you know, medicine has been studying that for many years now, or certainly forty or fifty years, seriously. So you know, if they haven't come up with the good ideas by now, we're in trouble. But um, I think it's probably. Uh, food system that's coming under the highest difficulty because we demand to have it cheap. We have to eat. We demand our food is cheap. We will buy food on the basis of cheapness, <clears throat> but it's not necessarily good for us. And as a result, you know, our, our health is struggling, and it's, it's being shown by lots and lots and lots of different. Um, um, bits of little bits of research, I mean, not terribly well amalgamated yet, but you know they say that you know an hour's exercise, our bodies start to fight off those potential cancer cells. But, you know, when does anybody ever talk about that? I've never seen it spoken of. They say yeah, it's good to have an exercise, but they haven't really said why. Um, you know, it it does evoke our own immune system to beef up and get going, and not not just cancers, but presumably other illnesses as well. And and also, you know, if we keep going for cheap, 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 what happens is, of course, is it, we can't actually bring it any cheaper. There's only so far you can cut things. There's only so much labour you can cut out by having, you know, robots and the like. There's only so much. Um, you know, land prices are land prices. You can't really do much about it very well unless you happen to be lucky enough to have owned it in your family for very, very many generations. So you've got it, so you haven't got to buy it. And, and people are using the land to invest, you know, the value of the land going up to invest in the equipment that they need. But there's only so much you can do. And, and well, I think with industrial agriculture, I mean, we're basically eating oil and gas. Mm. You know, that we have, we don't have soil anymore, we have dirt. And somebody has to go over it with a big tractor and pour gas and oil based fertilizers and pesticides and you know, insecticides to grow the food so that it can be provided cheaply. Um, you know, the problem is that the, were we to do anything else, we'd collapse our economies. Because basically the disposal, disposable income that we've now all got because we don't pay a fortune for food is what fuels everything else. Uh, so all of the people that are out playing Pokemon Go or whatever the latest craze is, you know, the reason you're able to do that is because we no longer pay most of our income on food. Mm. If we started to shift back to a much simpler economy in many ways um, where f food and energy costs became much higher than they are now, mm. then actually a lot of those other economic things are going to go away. Um, yeah, you... Going back to the days of that. See, it's sad that we can't see the, the benefits of doing some of that now. I mean, I, I don't really advocate that we should all go out and, and spend 24-7 you know, digging a garden and growing our own food. But there's nothing to stop us doing bits of it. There's an interesting article in there's an online magazine called Resilience. Uh, one of their contributors was making the point that as they talk, looking around for people that were what they put in quotes, self-sufficient. And the point they got to was even some of the best permaculturists around the world, who people might think of as self-sufficient, aren't really self-sufficient. 
what they mean is that this is somebody that grows enough food on their plot that they can exchange it for other food and they could technically stay alive. Mm. But his point was, well, even that, if you drill into it, well, you might say if your land is producing a lot of vegetables, that's great. But unless you're producing crops like potatoes that are high in carbohydrates, it's not getting you anywhere near your calorie intake. Um, now, his argument was, well, yeah, actually, instead of all of us sort of digging our own individual vegetable patches, we would do better if we supported a local farmer that was growing food properly on a local farm. Mm. So essentially, I don't think so. That's okay. I'm not sure that I totally agree. Um, mm. I do think we should be supporting our own farms and our local farmers because they're obviously going to have their setup is already efficient. Mm. And they're, they are, you know, they've got the skill already there. That's what they do for a living, they're skilled. You know, they, won't, they wouldn't be still in farming if they didn't know what they were doing mm. because <laughs> you don't make money out of it unless you do. In mm. fact, you know, you're hard pushed to make 2 or 3% of where most of us you know, expect yeah. a lot more than that, although I suppose at the moment that might not, be, it might not quite be so true. But, mm. um, you know, Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree we should be supporting our local farmers and getting to know them better and helping them by buying through their gate, if we can. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that at the moment, as you say, it's so much cheaper to go to a supermarket where they'll have imported a shipload of potatoes or something from abroad that could just as easily have been grown down the road. Um, I, the, the danger of that that I tend to highlight all the time is if for any reason the global supply chains break down, and that can happen for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it mm. could be the next banking crash taking out the way of paying people. It could be an oil crisis that means that the price of shipping stuff gets too high. It could be some kind of revolution or war in the country that we're getting the supplies in from. And there's a whole load of different things that can impact that. Uh, the more we become dependent on sort of cheap imports, the more vulnerable we are to that disruption. Mm. Um, and the problem is then that were we in that kind of crisis to turn around and say, well, what about the farmer up the road? The problem is that the only way the farmer up the road has managed to stay in business is to export dairy products around the world. Um, so what you're going to have is a, an abundance of something that probably isn't enough for everyone. Uh, so we might have an abundance of dairy in Britain, but we can't live on dairy alone. Um, whereas the vegetables that we need in our diet are going to come in from abroad because nobody's growing them here because we can get them cheaper elsewhere. Uh, so in a sense, in order to be have cheap food, we almost inevitably have vulnerable food supplies. Um, you know, whereas if you want a resilient food supply, then you end up one way or another having to pay for it. Yes, very much so. I'm, I'm, I'm the Secretary of our local allotments and that's one of the things that comes up many, many times. You know, why do you grow your own vegetables? Is it cheaper? Well, the answer is absolutely categorically no, it isn't. It isn't cheaper. Mm. But you can't beat taste when they come straight off the block, you know, because you, you've picked it and eaten it there and then or, or that day or within at least a day or two. They've not travelled across the globe and they've been picked when they're at their best. Hmm. So there's there's no doubt about that. You know, you, I don't think there's any child who's been down and picked a few peas and nicked them out of the pods. Hmm. Wouldn't, wouldn't admit that they taste a heck of a lot better than anything you could ever buy. buy. Because they just do. You get them fresh straight from the crop. And, and that mere freshness gives them a, an amazing taste. Hmm. But, but cost-wise, no, that's, in fact, was one of the reasons why I went away from it when I was struggling as a single mum looking after the kids and I stopped growing my own because mm. I simply couldn't allow the time. Mm. And I'm, I'm in the luxurious position again now while the kids are growing up. It's only Andy and I, so I can. I can do that. And I can, I can achieve pretty much if I put my effort in. But it doesn't always work. You know, you get years when the slugs have eaten all the cabbages and there aren't any, you know, okay your potatoes have done brilliantly well this year and my peas and beans are doing pretty well but mm. my squash is useless now i've said the plot just a few plots up the fabulous mm. squashes so it just depends i guess on on um 
you know, whether you got them in the right place, whether you got them in the ground at the right time. Hmm. And, and I put my, I started mine in the greenhouse and then put them out quite late and they just stopped. You didn't seem to want to bother to grow any further. Hmm. And you think, I wonder why that was really. Perhaps I put them out a bit late. The, the, hmm. the difference in temperature, maybe, I don't know, but they certainly don't seem to be doing a lot now. Hmm. I've had a few, yeah. I've had a few, I can't say I've done nothing, but, but nothing like as many as I've had before when I put them in the ground early. I said, perhaps they needed the cold to get them started. Yeah, we walked past the local allotments here yesterday. Uh, uh, my son was comparing the difference between what was growing on the allotment and what grows in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit mean. <laughs> well, but then as I pointed out to him, you know, the people that are running those allotments have probably spent a decade or more preparing that soil to get it to that stage. But, you know, well, that's, that's, that certainly shows that, you know, the, the, the old boys are really good at this, aren't they? Well, hmm. There's a good reason for that. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. started like we did in their 30s but they've, or 40s or whatever it was, but hmm. they've been every single year, every single solitary year, adding the, the uh, organic matter to the ground so that the, yeah. so the worm builds up and the, and the microorganisms in the soil build up and... Hmm. Gradually, gradually, and it does take time. They do get better. Hmm. Yeah, so I read somewhere recently that they reckon the world now has less, than, or was it? No, it was the UK. UK soil has about 60 harvests left in it. Um, that basically because we've done in intensive industrial agriculture where we haven't replenished the soils, um, that basically there's the nutrients are going. <laughs> That, you know, we can grow another 60 crops worth if we're lucky. And after that, that's it. The soil is dead. We're not going to be growing anymore. The uh, problem with that, of course, is because, if, if you know, I would say most farmers would probably take issue with that because, you know, it's like a battering of the old farmer. But the truth is we actually grow to eat. So we're taking that product off the soil. We're yeah. not. Yeah. That's that's the, the flaw in the organic movement really. You have to be able to put something back in it mm. to create that. And they say, oh yeah, animal mark. Well, well what are the animals eating? And they're going to eat as well and they're taking from the field to create body weight. And then with somehow the fact that we put a bit of muck back, yes, it does it does work and of course it works, and so does the straw and all the other things. But we're taking away from the ground a product that we want to eat. So to be able to put it back, we've got to somehow collect a lot of energy from somewhere or other. And um, a great deal of people complain bitterly if farmers do start putting um, human manure back on the ground. Hmm. But we're eating it. We, we're using most yeah. of it. But, but it's uh, very smelly. And there's the risk of, you know, perhaps that the disease on fruit, if you've used that muck on ground, that you are then going to take the product off of. Hmm. This needs to be a cut in the system. So I guess you put that on the ground that's growing grass that feeds hmm. animals that then goes back on the ground <laughs> producing food for us. So you get a bit of a break in that system. Yeah. So where are you going to get it from? Where are you going to get all this extra stuff from? You can start, you know. Well, I mean, at the moment, we at the moment we're digging out a huge phosphate pile from South America that we've been using for the best part of a hundred years. And it's basically fossilized bird poo. Mm. Um, basically, we've been shipping that in by the container load day by day to pour onto our fields. And unfortunately, it's running out. Mm. Uh, and as you say, I mean, the inconvenient truth in it is if we don't put back what we've been taking off, then it doesn't work in the long term. It's the same as the energy, isn't it? You, know, yeah. you can't create it out of nothing. It's got to come from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, you've got to create one way or another a closed system so that the nutrients that you're living on go back into the land. Um, yeah, I mean, on a small scale in pre-industrial times, people did that. Um, you know, I mean, they used to call it collecting the night soils. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was just how it was done. <laughs> now I think we've got used to a sanitized world where you don't have to do that. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, as you say, people will complain about the smell when you start spreading treated human waste back onto the fields. But if we don't do that, we, I mean, it creates two problems. And the one is we're throwing all of those nutrients away. The other problem is they're ending up in the sea and they create nutrient-rich seas 
that then lead to algae plumes. Uh, so basically you end up deoxygenating the water so that the water dies. Um, well, that's, that's good to let the algae, because that, that's an effective, uh, effective use of, of um, effective nitrogen, um, your nutrient base. But see yeah. that after you chuck it out in one arena and bring it back in, it's the same as buying food from across the world. Mm. No, I think if you look at NASA's satellite images of any of the world's big river estuaries, you'll see huge green algae plumes running off hundreds of miles out into the ocean. And it's all of the nutrients from the land getting into the water and fueling those microscopic sort of plant creatures to, to thrive. And of course, the byproduct of those creatures, because they poop as well, is they produce hydrogen sulfide, which kills the water underneath them. Yeah. So you get huge dead zones where any fish or marine creature that's unfortunate enough to swim into them drops dead for lack of oxygen. Uh, the paradox in all of that, of course, is that's how oil was formed in the first place. Of course. Because mm. uh, it was all of those dead plant, you know, microscopic plants floating their way down to the bottom of the floor in an area of sea that didn't have any oxygen that preserved them and allowed them to be compressed into oil. Um, so there is a certain irony that our oil-based agriculture might actually create the conditions for another round of oil in 60 million years or so. <laughs> yes, makes it, you know, you wonder, don't you, at, at what point do we think, give up then? You know, well, if, if we can't do it, do we give up? And I think that, you know, in a way, that's perhaps what's happening. It seems to me like the more we talk about eco-friendly, the more people want to fly away on holiday to, you know, to see the world. Yeah. And, and I wonder sometimes whether that doesn't come back to the same thing. Well, we've got it at the moment. Let's make the most of it. In 10 years' time, we might not be there. Hmm. Yeah, that I think is the risk. So, I mean, there's what I call catastrophists. I mean, there's people that look at climate change and say, oh, we're all going to be extinct in 30 years' time anyway. And as you say, the danger of that line of thinking is just let's not bother doing anything that's just party for the next couple of years because we're all dead anyway. Uh, that I haven't seen the evidence for it. Um, uh, that isn't to say that these people aren't presenting evidence. I just think the evidence they're presenting is highly contested. Mm. So I, I'm not saying that we definitely aren't going to all be dead in 30 years' time. We might be. I just think on the weight of the evidence at the moment, it's probably unlikely. Um, you know, what we are storing up are some pretty horrible conditions for our children and grandchildren. Um, yes, they're certainly going to, they're going to have a, a tough time. Well, it'll certainly not be as, as uh, fossil fuel generated as ours is because it can't be. Yeah. Because the cost of taking out the ground, what there is, is going to be far too high to actually be useful. So are we condemning them to cavemen-like existence? That's slightly worrying. <laughs> uh, if we do nothing, then probably we are. So essentially, if we keep on pretending that we can run an oil-based economy without any oil, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not even without oil. I mean, there's more oil being pumped out of the ground today than has ever been pumped out of the ground on a single day ever before. The problem is that the economy that we've built depends on that amount of oil growing day by day, and you just get to a point where you just cannot grow it anymore. Uh, so we'll never get to a point where we run out of oil. There's always going to be oil around. And it's just going to get much more costly to produce and we're going to struggle to produce anything like what we're producing now. Um, I, somebody likened it to me, imagine if you know, some as yet unknown aunt, you, know, you get a letter saying that your unknown aunt has left you a million pound in her will and you think, wow, great, I'm a millionaire. But then you read down the will and one of the conditions is that you're only allowed to draw out a hundred pound a week. You know, so suddenly you're not a millionaire, you're, you've got £100 extra a week. But we can have all of the oil under the ground, but if we can't extract it all, or if we can't extract it quickly enough, then we're like the person that's got a million quid in the bank, but we can only get it £100 a week. You know, essentially there's a limit to what we can get out of the ground, even though there's plenty under the ground. Mm. 
that then has its impact on the economy we've built because we assumed that we'd always have more and more oil. Mm -hmm. um, and it's at that, it's that point where the economy meets this that is where we experience it. Um, so it becomes I mean, a few years ago when we had very high oil prices, people at the bottom of the income scale stopped driving. Uh, there's a period two or three years ago where Britain's carbon emissions from road transport went down because people stopped driving and it's subtle. It isn't like they stopped driving altogether. It's just they stopped going for day trips on the weekend because they needed the fuel to get back and forth to work. <laughs> um, that's the kind of worrying thing, isn't it? Because that's what actually happens. Hmm. It's very wealthy carry on as though nothing happened. Yeah. And the, the poor of folk of life always are the ones who get hit. And that's the real dilemma. Are we going to expect that of our children? You know, because some of them will be successful and become the next big business people, but not all of them. Or is that it? You know, we just have to, to consider that, you know, and we have to be bright, clever, successful business people and not worry about the rest of the world. That's That's the... Mm. Capitalist dilemma, isn't it? Well, I think the story we told ourselves, I mean, the myth is that we're all self made men and women, kind of, <laughs> whereas actually we depended on a huge amount of support from our society. Um, if you like, the, the story that we've told ourselves and that we've passed on is that you go to school, you pass your exams, you go to university, you come out, you get a good job. And even if you borrow money to go to university, it'll be all right because you'll be paid more in future than you are today. Now, the entire of that myth is dependent on our use of resources on a finite planet continuing to increase. But essentially, the extra income that we were always going to get back to pay today's debts has to come from somewhere. And it comes from, if you like, the real economy of actually using those resources to make things. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get to the point where actually everything starts getting more expensive, that whole story goes into reverse. And I mean, we're already seeing it where I think the average income of a graduate in 2007, just before the crisis, was 24,000 a year. The average graduate salary today is 24,000 a year. So we're eight years on and graduate living standards are the same as they were then. So add in the inflation, they've actually gone backwards. I would say that's very true of my business too, because hmm. I've been in business now for seven years and I run a cleaning company. And the prices I charged seven years ago is exactly the price I charged, well, hmm. given a couple of quid an hour more. But there are limits to what people are able to pay. Not, not, not that they're necessarily unwilling, but they're, or maybe they are unwilling, hmm. um, because there are cleaning industry is one that you can get into very easily you don't have to have much uh, um, you don't have to have a lot of equipment mm. personally I have invested in it and I have got you know, the carpet cleaners and the rest of it but um, you don't have to you can just go out with a few cleaning costs and a, and a few products from the local shop and away you go um, so it's your labour then. So your labour is negotiable, I guess. And a lot of people who are coming in desperate because they've got no other income are prepared to do it cheaper. The same, the argument for the, you know, the Brexit, I guess, they were complaining that people are prepared to do it cheaper because they've come with nothing and they have to earn. Hmm. Yeah, but it takes you into a race to the bottom. Right? As everybody then is out to undercut everybody else. And as you say, your labor then becomes the one variable that you have that you can say, well, okay, I can't offset my costs for equipment. The one thing that I've got that I can lower the cost of is my own labor. Now, the problem when you translate that into a whole system is you imagine what happens to the economy if everybody is doing the same thing. Mm. So essentially, we're all trading the cost of our labor down. And you find this in employment where people are reluctant to take or to ask for pay rises because they're more worried about keeping their job. So wages tend to stagnate. And the problem is then that the entire economy starts to run out of money. Well, that's what's uh, happening, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, we're slowly strangling ourselves with that. So you see the situation now with, I think it's in the news either today or yesterday, about uh, 
students now complaining about the amount of debt that they're struggling under because they borrowed to go to university because they were promised that things were going to get better. And they find themselves in fairly low paid jobs where they just see no way of paying that debt off. And as an economy, we depend on them paying that debt off fairly quickly because we also want them to take out loans for a new car and we want them to buy, buy houses and do all of the other things that were part of how the economy used to work. I remember thinking that when it first came in, my, my children were just hitting university at that time. I said, well, come out of university with a £30,000 debt. Hmm. Oh, everybody's doing it, Mum. And I'm thinking, £30,000 debt, that's what we used to expect to have to raise to buy a house with. Yeah. Now, well, that put a deposit down, but even so, if you have got a debt to get rid of, how on earth are you going to get a £30,000 deposit? And, and you see, I've seen it all around me in my coast where I live. There are youngsters still living at home who are in their 30s. And that's not by accident. That's because they no, cannot no. raise sufficient funds to get a home of their own. And, and it's not very well to say, oh, they'll get married and there'll be two of them. But even so, even two people have to raise a huge amount of money for a reasonable deposit in a reasonable home. And, and you know, the, the wages are not, they are stagnating. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all working, all of those so youngsters. They're not, they're not, it's not that they're not working. Same as my own children. But one of the other things we've generated, you know, because we've set up this really punitive welfare system, where it's very difficult to be on benefits at the moment, so if you're a young person facing a choice between either being on benefits or going to college, in the short term, college looks like a much better option. So essentially, you're going to borrow all of that money, but it means you're going to have money in your pocket. <laughs> and it means for three years, you're not going to have somebody on your back every week telling you that you've got to send CVs to people who are, quite frankly, never going to employ you. So a lot of people are actually opting for college as a way of escaping being stuck on benefits. Now, it works for government because they tick a box saying, oh, well, that's exactly what we want. We want unemployed people to go and educate themselves. And isn't it great? That only works if they're going to get a job at the end. If they're not going to get a job at the end, all you've done is created another wodge of unrepayable debt. Uh, and essentially, those people are now going to spend the next 30 or 40 years paying off that debt rather than spending oh. money into the economy. Or not paying off debt because they can't, because they don't have to start paying off till they raise I don't know, 15,000 a year or something. Mm. We've actually got to have a job first, even 15. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as I say, I mean, underlying all of this is I mean, essentially that energy is getting more expensive. And essentially, that's the underlying thing that deals with the whole myth. Because for 300 years, we've had growing access to ever cheaper energy. Uh, we started with coal back 300 years ago, then we discovered oil and we did that. Now we've got gas and nuclear, we've done that. What we're now discovering is, well, we can still get the stuff, but we've got to invest far more of the economy's spare capital into getting it than we ever did. And once the energy cost goes up, everything that uses energy goes up as well, so that our food becomes more expensive, our housing becomes more expensive. What that, I mean, effectively, what that does to that myth is turns it on its head. So, if you were starting a business where the expectation used to be that you had a good business idea, you went to the bank, presented your business plan, they gave you a loan, and off you went. Now, you would only do that if you were pretty sure that you'd get more money into the business than you borrowed. Mm. Uh, yeah, not least because, as small business people, you'd probably have to put your house up as collateral. <laughs> What we're now getting to is a time where actually it's the likelihood is that you're not going to pay the debt off, that it's going to be harder every year to pay that debt than rather than getting easier. Um, so essentially your wages are stagnating, but the cost of everything else is going up. Therefore, the cost of servicing the loan that you took out on the business at the very beginning is getting harder to service. It's one of the reasons we have record low interest rates across the global economy. So essentially, globally, we're happy finding it harder and harder to pay our debt off. So the only way of making it easy is to keep lowering the interest rate. And eventually, you get down to the lunacy of them just deciding we'll have negative interest, where it, you will actually have to pay for the privilege of having money in the bank. <laughs> and the idea is that we'll all take our money out and go and spend it, whereas what we'll actually do is take it out and put it under the mattress. Uh, so it isn't going to benefit the economy. <laughs> 
but we are stuck in that spiral. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is why I say that a lot of the problems to do with sustainability play out in the economic field, not in the fields where they're being caused. Mm. Um, so yes, food production is getting more expensive, but we're not going to see it in those terms. We'll just see it as, oh, food prices have gone up. And energy extraction costs are getting higher, but we're not going to see it in those terms. We're just going to see it translated into the price of everything that uses energy has gone up. Um, yeah, and for most of us, most of the time, it's going to be, well, you know, it's getting to be a real struggle to pay back debt. It just already is. Well, I would say that that's already hitting the vast majority. Well, it's certainly what they say, the middle classes are struggling, that their money doesn't go as far as it used to, and they can't work out why. Hmm. So I think the bigger problem then in terms of the solutions, once you get to this point where people stop taking on new debt, you know, which I think we're fairly close to, then all of the solutions that we're looking at to the problem go by the way as well, because nobody wants to invest in them. Mm. So essentially you could deploy a lot of money to put up lots of offshore wind power stations and generate lots of cheap electricity, but you've got to be confident that borrowing the money is going to pay off. Mm. And I, the problem we're in at the moment is nobody's really sure. No, which is why they're not doing it, kind of, I guess. Because uh, it's not that the energy isn't there. The problem is the other end. It's essentially when I've built my wind farm and I'm generating my effectively free energy from the wind, am I going to be able to charge customers enough the other end to pay back my investment? But if the economy is going backwards and people have got less and less money every year, then they're not going to be able to afford it anyway. So if you like, it becomes a much more risky proposition, even though in any sensible kind of way of looking at it, you'd go and do it. Uh, now, my feeling is that the only way it's going to happen is if government steps in and actually does it. But I think we're st governments are too stuck in the ideology of leave it to the market. Um, yeah, and one thing markets are really good at is if something is too expensive, they won't do it. Yes. So I guess it does come back down then to us as individuals to make the decision to recognise that the problem is there and to do something about it and to attempt ourselves to live a little bit simpler and be a little bit more self-sufficient to do some of those things ourselves and learn the skills. And it seems to be... I'm quite surprised. It seems to be taking off around large parts of America. There's, hmm. There seems to be an, an, a recognition that it really is going to be quite tough and hmm. that you need to prepare yourself, skill yourself now. Um, here there seems to be a bit of a recognition among the transition towns movements, perhaps a little bit in the link for growth movement. People have started to recognise that actually, come on, we need to step up here and put this right. How are we going to do it? If we leave it to governments, it just isn't going to happen. They're just not going to. Can we group together in big enough clusters of community and do it without them? Just say, well, hmm. oh, we're going to do it anyway. We, we, can, we can put up um, solar panels all over our schools, all over our buildings, all over our homes. We don't need you to say yes or no. Can we create a mini grid here? Because it's obviously going to be very, very much more important for our future and for our children that we do. And that we skill ourselves. We all need to at least learn how to make or produce our own foods, to make our own clothes, to do all the basic things we need to make our own homes. Even if we don't do it and we recognise the value of what other people are doing more carefully, more, more. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that was one of the things, as I mentioned before, when I first went to move onto a boat, uh, you can't just click that light and expect it to come on. You actually mm -hmm. have to generate the power first. In my case it, that meant turn the engine on, burn a fuel, or you could put your solar panels on the roof and I imagine that was quite a useful way of doing it on a boat because you're not on it all day. So it's trickle feeding into your batteries all day. So you've got you know you've got it there for when you come home. But um and not used much. It didn't, didn't run tellies and computers and stuff on the boat too much. But it is a much more frugal way of living, much more frugal. Yeah, I mean, my guess is for the time being that we're just going to see people drop off the bottom of the income scale. So yes, when, we, when that bottom of the income scale gets to be a large number of people, hmm. it's already pretty big. 
Yeah. Well, it comes, I mean, it's all very much the same. There's nobody unemployed, but that's because we're all self-employed, not earning anything. Hmm. So, so the reality is that that is already getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. When that comes down to people not having enough to eat, then there's going to be serious disruption. Well, I think it's when it gets into the middle classes, uh, which I think to a degree it has. Uh, and I think it's why you get the political sphere. You're seeing things like Brexit here. You see Donald Trump in America. That you're starting to see significant portions of the middle classes starting to worry about their income being squeezed. Because uh, we already know that, I mean, there were what, all, over a million visits to food banks last year. So we already know that there are people making hard choices about whether they're going to eat or whether they're going to have the lights on. Uh, and God knows what that does to the next generation of people who aren't going to be getting an education because they can't do homework at home because there's no electricity. Um, but that's already happening. I mean, it's when it starts to eat into sort of a wider group of the upper working classes, the middle classes, where suddenly people are, I, one of the things I think we'll start to see in the next few years is people walking away from their jobs. Uh, yeah, at the moment, unemployment is more or less an imposed thing that nobody is choosing it. Mm -hmm. What I think we'll get to, I mean, particularly when oil prices next go up, so I think people are going to be confronted with the cost of running a car, actually meaning that the job they're doing isn't providing an income, it's actually costing them. And I, once people get to that point and begin to realize that that isn't going to go away, that it's never going to get any easier, I think people in probably fairly skilled jobs will just say, look, I've had enough. I'm going to go and get a lower paid job closer to home and just get rid of the car. And then um, those very skilled people will take the jobs to those people that currently yeah. are not so skilled. Because that's what happens. That's the truth. When, when, when the labor market is higher than the jobs market, what happens is people employ very highly skilled people to do very mundane things. Yeah, which is why even now we have graduates flipping burgers in Burger King. Um, but I think where it disrupts is so you take a city like London, where it's going to rely on an awful lot of people who commute in, who are doing precisely those kind of jobs where it's a balance as to whether doing the job is paying or not. So it could be people like teachers, firemen, policemen, nurses. Oh, it's already happening. How many, how yeah. many teachers do you hear? I'm, I'm fed up with it. They might love the job, but they're fed up with the bureaucracy. They're coming up. they droves. Really yeah. bright, clever, effective teachers. I mean, they're not all, of course. Not, not every teacher is as good as we'd like them to be. But an awful lot of very effective teachers are coming out. And they're saying, no, enough's yeah. enough. We're not doing this anymore. We cannot do... 10 jobs in one, you know, when you're asked to take on another department and another department and another department, three or four at a time, instead of, you know, it's just not realistic. And mm. prove that you can do it, not just do it, but prove that you can do it first. Mm. It becomes more and more and more bureaucratic and people are walking right and saying, no, thank you very much. It's, it's, mm. it's not sensible. Yes, yeah, so I think it's the moment we start seeing that group of workers walking away is the moment where the whole house of cards comes down. <laughs> yeah, and then if we leave it, to get to that point, then we will have to live sustainability, not by choice, but it'll be imposed on us. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, we will live a much more, much less material way of living. But there are, you know, the, uh, the ideal way of doing that. And there's an American writer called John Michael Greer, who came out with this lovely slogan, get your collapse in early and avoid the rush. <laughs> uh, but his basic proposition is, if we did it in a planned way now, and kind of worked out what kind of economy we can have with the resources available to us and live sustainably, then we can actually plan to get there without too much disruption. Whereas the longer we leave it, the more likely we're going to suffer a huge economic collapse uh, you know, of the kind that we last saw probably in the 1930s, maybe even worse than that. Um, you know, with all of the horrors that came as a result of that, you know, all of that social disruption, eventually the hatred and the war that came out of it, all of that looms over us because we're not planning and making the necessary steps in advance. I wonder myself whether that's partly what's going behind the wars that are happening now, actually, if you think about the, the so-called Muslim war. It's mm. supposedly, it's supposedly uh, um, religious, but I, I have my doubts. But, and they can see the Western world and all of 
funds we have. Mm. Not all parts of the world got what we have, but now we're more vulnerable because it's much more, um, we can see it, with, it's all over the internet, what how people are living, mm. and the fact that some people got a great deal more than others. Anyway, mm. with that final note, I think we're getting on a bit, really, it's, it's nearly half past mm. four now, and I think the um, marketing program is coming in behind us, so uh, we probably need to get off the air. But um, what's, what's your bit of good news that can keep us going for the next couple of weeks to make us think? Oh, I've got a really good harvest off my green gauge bushes on the weekend. So it's okay. going to be green gauge liqueur and green gauge jam. <laughs> that sounds decidedly tasty. I managed to get a few green, uh, not green, uh, the first pickings of our yellow tomatoes. We've put about eight plants in. Just starting to come right it seems to have taken quite a while but they're coming so i'm quite pleased about them lots of lots of green beans coming in at the mm. moment and um i'm definitely going to have a little go at this soap making and i'm really keen to uh have a go and see if i can create a fungicidal soap that mm. is pleasant to use and that still maintains the properties of the natural plant mm. Fung fungicidal resistance well, I shall look forward to seeing it then. Yeah, so in a couple of weeks' time, we'll have to uh, see what we can manage. Hmm. Right, I'm going to come off there now. <laughs>